both for you to be here tonight. We put it on a very rainy night in February. That doesn't happen often, and we put it on Valentine's Day. I uh, I was taken back by that and was uh, quite surprised. As well, I don't know if we did poor planning, but uh, I assume that those who um, who made it tonight may well have forgotten that occasion. And it may not be too late. There's a drugstore on the main street. <laughs> I don't think I can top what Harold Minton said uh, when he talked about the fellow who was trying to respond to his uh, uh, introduction, but he got his words tangled up a little bit, and he said, uh, I don't much appreciate those words, but I deeply deserve them. <laughs> there was one where uh, I went to a conference on evangelism, and the uh, then director of the evangelism for the American Baptist churches, uh, Emmett Johnson was the guest speaker. And he was introduced uh, on the platform by a person who obviously knew him for a little while. But uh, he started off and Johnson was sitting over to the side and he said, once in a lifetime, a true man of God can lead you on the scene. Once in a lifetime, a gifted evangelist comes on who can articulate the gospel like nobody else ever has. Once in a lifetime, someone comes along with those rare abilities where they can preach the gospel of Christ and also be a faithful follower of Christ and the Spirit of God shows in their life. And until that person comes, I give you Emmett Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very much like that. I've seen a number of you at uh, your churches, and when I read through the list uh, that Allison gave, uh, uh, a bit ago about those who've been in this spot. I'm very uh, appreciative of the invitation. And I have shared, I think, in a couple of your churches uh, when I compared myself to my predecessors in this role, and I feel very much like that fellow who went from uh, uh, Philadelphia out to Texas to be a guest preacher in a church. He was a Bible conference teacher back uh, in uh, 1920. And uh, the pastor got sick when uh, he was to introduce the speaker that day, and so they had a layman stand up said, uh, we have had some pretty high-ranking preachers in our pulpit, but this morning we have the rankest of them all. <laughs> and, uh, that's somewhere where I'm going. I want to talk about some big items for a few moments before I get into the subject of leadership. And over the next uh, couple of days, uh, I'm more excited about uh, tomorrow night uh, and also, and if I don't... Uh, if I blow it tonight, you know, if there's only 20 here tomorrow night, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, but also, uh, you know the war department in all churches today, that's worship, that's Wednesday night. So we saved that last so I wouldn't get shown too soon. I want to get through these others uh, a little bit uh, sooner. But uh, there's a number of things that I'd like to share with you about, uh, about leadership, but there's a presupposition that's absolutely critical, it's foundational, it's everything in the world that I think is is important. Uh, the most important assumption of what, everything that I'm going to say in the next couple of days comes to a word that has been minimized and thrown out the door and people have neglected for almost a hundred years and even in the evangelical camp with which I am most familiar, uh, people have minimized it and when I taught uh, a number of years ago at a, a college in the Midwest and a seminary, I still remember people coming along and making fun of what I think is right at the core of what Christian faith is all about. Absolutely no book of the New Testament would have been written without it. No mission would have been taking place without it. Nothing that you see in the Bible would have happened without it. And what that it is, is an overwhelming, transforming experience with God. God did something in the lives of some individuals, and it transformed their lives, and without that, there would never have been any preaching, there would never have been any teaching at all of the gospel. Nobody would have taken the time to write anything down if they hadn't had that overwhelming, transforming experience with God. 
And I'm going to be doing my best to switch back and forth to uh, some overhead work along the way. And if Mark uh, was trying to figure out, he said, we want a sharp at the top or the bottom. <laughs> and he succeeded in getting neither. Anyway. <laughs> I did want to tell ahead of time because I didn't want everybody doing that. Uh, everything that I'm sharing with you tonight in, is in manuscript form already, less the jokes and all of that other stuff. Uh, and you can have a copy of it at the end of this time. Uh, you have three options for, for uh, uh, getting it. Uh, it. It'll cost either you can endow a chair at the Divinity College. <laughs> That's only a million four hundred thousand. You can leave us in your will for at least 50%, or you can just have it. And uh, take one of those three options, and uh, we'll let you uh, uh, decide. But anyway, you can get a copy of it. We'll have those out uh, uh, at the end. The, the background for the experience, the primary assumption, uh, is an important issue, in part because it's one of the most neglected in the New Testament studies today. Uh, this last year, a man uh, by the name of Luke Timothy Johnson, if you haven't seen his writings, oh, he's a terrific New Testament scholar. He's well-balanced. He comes from the Catholic tradition, and he wrote a book called The Exp Religious Experience in Earliest Christianity. And I've got the bibliography for everything that I'm going to say tonight, and you can look that up if you're interested. But uh, he talked about how for more than a century, biblical scholars were dominated by empiricism. Namely, trying to objectify all truth with critical historical reasoning. And through that process, they essentially gutted Christianity of anything that was experience-oriented. The tragedy was that many in the evangelical community bought into that. I can remember not too many years ago when people started talking about uh, religious faith and the college that I, where I taught uh, when I first began. I remember folks making jokes about songs. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. One of those old songs that used to warm the cockles of our hearts, and they were making fun of it. And when I challenged that, they called me Leaping Lee, you know, you leap of faith type stuff. And this guy doesn't care about all of the historical critical methodology. But um, they missed the point. And I saw tracks, and I'm sure that many of you have as well, that showed the, the train and had the uh, the engine up in the front, and then the coal car, and then the caboose. You remember those things? And of course, the engine was the fact of what God has done in Christ. That's absolutely essential. And the coal car, it's our faith in Christ makes it possible for us to have a new life in Christ. And the third thing, the caboose, was what? Experience. Which means we can get along without it. It's not that important. I still remember somebody talking to me about uh, when you become a Christian, just confess your sins. And what that means is not repentance in the sense of I'm so sorry. It means just acknowledge to God, you know, God, you're right. I acknowledge that's wrong, and uh, let's get on with life. Hogwash. And it doesn't transform anybody's life. There's a couple of texts of scripture that talk about experience. And in fact, in the manuscript that you'll have, I put about 30 references to it, but uh, there's scores of them, scores and scores of people who talked about a religious experience with God. In chapter 4 of the book of Acts, verse 31, when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together were shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Boy. That's not simply a college <coughs> experience at all. There's another text. It's found in the book of Romans where Paul speaks about God's love has been poured out or shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. That's an experience of the holy or the presence of God, Romans 5.5. 5. Another uh, passage of scripture, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 18, and all of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 
for this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. That was not sweet by and by. Paul was talking about reality now. There is something that God does in our life that transforms us. And that is the presupposition for all Christian teaching, for all Christian preaching, for all discipleship, for all evangelism, for all worship, for everything we do is to try to find a way to get people in touch with Almighty God. Now, why do people go to church? A number of studies have been taken in this very area, and uh, uh, I noted one from a Canadian. His name is Thomas Bandy, and he is the Director of Evangelism and Church Planting for the United Churches of Canada. And uh, they did a survey of thriving churches, and why did people go to those churches? And even to other churches, but they especially surveyed the thriving churches, and they were asked, the people were asked, why, why do you go to church? And it was surprising to some because it wasn't because they were seeking to know that there's a God. They pretty much assumed it. They weren't there to, uh, because they were delighted with the music. Some of them was pretty good. They weren't there because they liked the rules and regulations. In fact, that was a turn off. They were there because they wanted a transforming experience with God. That was over 90%. The good news is, boy, do we have some good news for some people who are looking for an experience with God. And if we fashion our gospel and promote it in ways that deny or minimize that, we're going to miss everything. Evangelism assumes it. In fact, it's the basis that we have for um, establishing that experience. It comes when a person gives his or her life to Jesus Christ, invites him to come into their life to forgive them of their sin, and there is a transformation that takes place. The New Testament uses a lot of vocabulary to speak about that transformation. Saved, born again, reconciled, expiated, justified, all of those reconciled essentially mean the same thing. A person has come into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And whenever we get away from that, we deny what our gospel is all about. That is the mission of the church. Now, tonight, I've been saying for a while, um, anyway, it's in the brochure, we want to talk about healthy churches and what produces a healthy <coughs> church. And essentially, a healthy church and I've used that term, a number of people have used it, a thriving church might be another one, but thriving sounds too much like it might be growing. And I'm not opposed to church growth. Please understand, I am absolutely for it. When we are doing what we ought to be doing as churches, I think they will grow. But having said that, some have greater growth potential than other churches do, and it doesn't mean God is blessing one more than the other. We're not talking of church growth here, we're talking of church health. I think a church is healthy when it is doing what God has called it to do. And you'll see, it in a nutshell, we could uh, go through, and I've done it a little bit in the manuscript that you can pick up, but in, uh, you'll see a part of what I'm trying to say in the passage uh, in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47, where the early church began its life in Christ in acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There was an acknowledgment of him as Lord. He is the Christ. He is the Lord. He is exalted. He is worthy. And then there was a call to repentance of faith. And uh, then they were called upon to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were called upon to be baptized. There was a call to faith, to repent, to be baptized, and to become a part of the community. And then you see in the well-known text in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they committed themselves, they were devoted to, they had become a part of a community that had teaching, the apostles' teaching, and also fellowship, or sharing, koinonia, and then breaking of bread together, and prayer. And I put those categories in terms of worship, is what at the core of what they ought to be doing and, uh, in, uh, in, in the area of worship. I'll say more about that a little bit later. Uh, this was a group of people that were committed to evangelism, to discipleship, which is what teaching is all about, it's mentoring, 
Uh, they were committed to fellowship, and that's prayer. I'm sorry, the, the love and the caring. The word koinonia means uh, to share or to partake of something, and it's giving to one another. They were breaking bread together. If you want to see a wonderful book, Jürgen Oltmann, a few years ago, wrote a book called um, A Passion for Living, A Messianic Lifestyle, in which he talked about those who eat together stay together. And he advocated Christians spending more time eating, and he talked about how the earlier uh, breaking of bread times, isn't that neat? <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> but he talked about how church life was wrapped up when you eat with somebody, you afford them importance and distinction. And when people eat together, lots of neat things do take place besides gaining a calorie or two. I remember a few years ago, there was a, a pastor, I went to see him in uh, Southern California. I love this preaching, but he was one good-sized fellow. I mean, he was Allison Price and me and Bob uh, Wilson all put together. And he came from the South, and he said, you know, where I come from, every Sunday, the people invite the preacher out for dinner. And if you don't eat everything, you offend those people. He said, and I never offended nobody. <laughs> The good news about a church's health is that it isn't dependent upon dollars, it isn't dependent upon location, it isn't dependent upon anything else. God gives the ability for every church to be a healthy church. The exact fact. It may not be able to grow. There's sometimes, you know, a little church that you drive 40 miles out to the, the middle of the country and there's only a hundred families within 20 miles and you've got uh, most of them in your church or a hundred people there, and they're not going to get 15 to 20,000 votes. But having said that, they have the potential for being healthy. And having said that also, regardless of where they are, I know a Methodist church that's so far out in the boonies it's incredible and when the pastor went there they had about a hundred and now they run about 10,000 he's got 60 on the staff in Ohio. I said, how in the world is that possible? And the reason it's possible is that people go to church because they want to have an experience with God. And they will drive as far as it takes to get there. Um, we had some people that came to our church in Southern California a number of years ago, and they drove 50 miles to get there. And I always said, we only advertise within a five-mile radius of the church. People have to pass it too many churches. I was absolutely off base on that. And somebody told them about the church, and they began to drive in there, and they joined the church and became uh, participants. And I said, uh, why did you come? And uh, they said, we like it here. And they put together a little sticker, and then they put it on a, a pin-on that you could carry on your shirt uh, pocket that said, a church alive is worth the drive. <laughs> and that answered that. And then several people started wearing those. It was great advertising for the church. People want that experience with God. And healthy churches provide that. And healthy churches have in place those basics of confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They are churches that have a teaching foundation uh, that is absolutely critical to who they are. Healthy churches know what the Bible says about their origins, their beginnings, their, their life now, their future, and so on. Unhealthy churches, you can grow a church and it can be very unhealthy and not at all be grounded and rooted in its faith. It's far more important to have a healthy church that knows what's going on. Well, there's uh, a number of characteristics about these healthy churches, and I'm not going to spend too much time... Um, uh, on that, I'm going to go into the area of leadership, but um, there's some other things that you can find, and these are often found in a number of your church growth magazines and so on, but they're typical. They've done surveys throughout North America and in Europe, and especially in England, to uh, talk about the kinds of things that help churches to grow. And one of the things that's characteristic of a church that is growing, or that is healthy, is that uh, even with a mobile population, and often that's a lot of cities, uh, a healthy church is one that doesn't stifle creativity, but welcomes it. Uh, I know that you have never been in a church. I have, but you haven't, because we only have them south of the border. But since I'm sorry, 
We've never done it that way before, which means we're not going to. Well, we've always done it this way, which also means this is the way we're always going to do it. It doesn't stifle creativity, but it welcomes it. By the way, if you need for me to tell you when I've said a joke, just let me know and I'll pass it on to you. <laughs> they're also rooted in their biblical and theological foundations and values, and they are adaptable to changes in society and life. One of the interesting things that's also a characteristic of uh, the biblical canon, the reason, one of the reasons that the books that we have in our biblical canon are there is those books that were adaptable to the changing times in the ancient history uh, of Israel as well as in the early Christian community. There were some books that were deemed inspired and authoritative early on that dropped out because they were not adaptable to change. That's also true of churches. Now in the New Testament, in terms of books, somewhere along the way I lost track of, I know I shouldn't be doing, thank you honey, I got my piece of paper back. I want to focus um, on uh, the characteristics of leadership tonight. Uh, there are a number of things that provide a healthy church, and one of them is the area of leadership. I don't know of churches that thrive, of churches that are healthy, or churches that grow, and those are not always the same category, that don't have strong leadership within the church. And often, and for generations, uh, seminaries never trained people in the area of leadership. Now it's a buzzword. It's going across uh, North America and Europe and people in South America. People are talking about it, finally, I think, uh, in very good ways. We never heard about leadership for when I was in seminary back in the 1960s. It just, nobody talked about it. We just sort of assumed that people would get there, and we bred a lot of failures. We had one of the highest in ministry, one of the highest uh, incidences of burnout and dropout in ministry of any of the professions. That's still true today. Now, part of the reason, I think, my view, uh, is that we didn't train people on how to be leaders in the church. We trained them how to think about their theology. We trained them how to do various kinds of things, the practice of ministry, but we didn't teach them how to be leaders in the church. And so this is all in the last 30 years has been a significant attempt at trying to address those particular problems. That's a part of what we're looking at here. Let me say something about the Bible and leadership. If you'd like to try something fun, and see, see if you can find in any Bible dictionary anything that deals with leadership. I couldn't find anything. I've looked at the, I looked at the best Bible dictionaries. Word's not even found. It's only found in a couple of places in the New Testament. Kubernetes is the term that's found for those in administrative uh, positions in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 28. And those who stand before you is the one that's used uh, in uh, uh, the book of Hebrews that's translated leaders, 13, verse 7, and also verse 17. But the Bible doesn't say an awful lot about leadership uh, per se. It doesn't spend any time discussing it. What it does do, though, is that it provides numerous wonderful examples of what leadership is all about. It does speak about leadership in sort of a passing way. Of course there's leaders in the church. And as you read the New Testament, you will see all kinds of them. There were those who were apostles. There were those who were prophets. Those who were teachers. Uh, those who were administrators, overseers, or bishops. A number of those kinds of titles are addressed and given in, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, interestingly, the New Testament doesn't speak a great deal about what uh, leadership is in that regard. It doesn't take any time out to say it, but it has some wonderful characteristics or examples of leadership in the story of Jesus. And I want to share a little bit about that uh, with you in a moment. But let me give it to you in a, a nutshell in terms of what a leader is. And uh, I'm going to come up with a bunch of characteristics, and I'm not going to go through all of them in any kind of detail. I just list them because you'll find so many of them. I went to New Orleans a couple of weeks ago, and I heard a fellow stand up and talk about, uh, he was sharing with the group of the, it was a, the conference was a boot camp for new principles. And uh, Terry knows what that's about already, but I have to learn the ropes, and he already knows it. But um, the guy said, well, I went to the airport again and went in and found another airport book on leadership. And he just, he said, who needs another book on leadership? Uh, that's the buzz stuff going on today. 
A leader is essentially someone who has a follower. That's Peter Drucker's succinct definition. Peter Drucker's really the guru in leadership today and the management model. Um, he has written some of the best books on that subject. But um, uh, he says that if a person doesn't have a follower, whatever else you want to call them, if you don't have followers, you're not a leader. Leaders have followers. There are a number of characteristics about them that are very important. And uh, he talks about some of those, and if I can find out where I am on my page outline, that'll be fine. I can share those, share those with you. But um, he speaks about how important it is to uh, focus on the leaders who produce results, the leaders who also uh, set examples, and those who take responsibility. All three are three characteristics of people in leadership roles. But let me preempt Peter Drucker for a few moments and talk about my primary vision, and that is the story of Jesus. You can find in the New Testament a number of examples of people who are leaders. Some are good and some are bad. There are times when Paul was a good leader. There's times he's a pain in the neck. Uh, there were times when Paul made a mistake, uh, and Barnabas picked up on it, and he and Barnabas split in the missionary activities over that particular issue of Mark. And uh, Barnabas saw that Mark had some value in him and wanted to reconstitute him for ministry after Mark failed in the first uh, missionary journey in Mark uh, 13, uh, about verse 14. Anyway, um, Paul said, absolutely not. And Barnabas says, yes, of course we will. And then they split. The great missionary team of the first century split over that particular issue. Eventually, Paul figured it all out, and he says, toward the end of his life, bring Mark with you, for he is profitable for ministry. But it took a while. But there is no greater example of what a, a, a leader is in the New Testament than the story of Jesus. This is an awesome one. And I listed some of the characteristics for you there. He was a person of vision. He was a person of passion. And by that, he, he did what he did with all of the gusto within him. It was everything that he, uh, he could put into something, whether it was talking to somebody, whether it was touching somebody and healing them. It was teaching the story of the kingdom of God. It was sharing with people, and thousands of people heard what he had to say. He had a vision for the kingdom of God, and he could share it in wonderful ways. He also was a person who had a willingness to risk. You remember how often Jesus uh, took on the religious leaders of his day. And it was a very risky kind of a thing to do, and it eventually cost him his life. But when the issue was the big issue, Jesus stepped forward and he said, no, that's not the correct way. This is the correct way. And when he did that in the temple, of course, uh, by cleansing the temple, and he said, my house is a house of prayer. It's not a, a den of robbers. And that eventually, along with the other things that he was doing when he was standing for principle, eventually cost him his life. But leaders are willing to lay down their life. They make enormous sacrifices. Uh, he had clear convictions. He was able to articulate them. It's incredible when you think about it. None of the writings of the New Testament emerged for the first 30 years after the death of Jesus. Roughly 30 years. And those that did, uh, well, uh, for Paul it would be closer to 20 years. But the Gospels themselves, the story of Jesus, at least 30 years, at least, uh, when they were written down, the Gospel of Mark being the first. And when you look at the Gospels and compare them, and you have different traditions that are putting coming together uh, in those Gospels, and they're putting forth a statement about Jesus, it is amazing how remarkably similar they were in their depiction of who Jesus was. It is amazing the, the caliber of his vision that is communicated in each of the Gospels, so that they don't contradict each other, they complement each other, and they have a, a, a wonderful way of impressing themselves upon people. Why was it that Jesus could speak like that? And people years later can remember. And they passed it on again and again. And they didn't stop talking for 30 years and didn't share anything. That was what they talked about. When the disciples came together with the church and there was the apostles teaching Acts 2.42, they didn't talk about the bread went up and the beans went down and peace be about the thing. They talked about Jesus. The vision that Jesus had was able to transform the lives of people. And so people continued to communicate it. And he was a team builder. Everybody knows that Jesus gathered together a team of people close to him, and he taught them, he trained them. He's a wonderful example of what a true leader is all about. Well, what is the hype all about? Well, the, the hype is about leadership 
today when people are talking about it, sometimes they're saying something that's always been true, and I think leaders in the church have always been true, that is nothing new, but that we're emphasizing it now is true, and I appreciate it. The three essential characteristics of the leadership that uh, uh, the, uh, typically are found in the uh, secular books on leadership include the uh, producing of results, leaders do that, uh, leaders set examples, and leaders take responsibility. If you haven't seen the book by Peter Stenge, and I don't know if I've said it right, I've heard it Stenge and Stenge, uh, anyway, he wrote that marvelous book in 1990 called The Fifth Discipline. My nephew, who's a businessman, um, an entrepreneur, uh, gave it to me as a gift, and I started reading it, and I said, oh, this guy really understands. And talking about what leaders do, in the past, leaders told people what to do. Now they're asking them questions. And in the past, they didn't understand what the role of the, of the uh, uh, CEO was all about as much, and uh, it caused a lot of problems in business. And Peter Stinch has come along with a, a new idea that says that the leader is the designer of the ship. The leader <coughs> designs what is taking place, designs the product. And also, the leader is the steward of the vision for what that product is and what that product does. He uses the example of a steamliner. And uh, he talks about how a number of people were surveyed to see which uh, was the most important person on the ship, and everybody said the captain. They said, what is the captain's most important function? <coughs> well, he gives direction to the ship. And he said they all missed it because they forgot that the captain cannot give directions if the ship won't turn this way or that way. The one who designed the ship has a greater impact on what the ship will do. The captain can only operate within this sphere, the designer in this sphere. And he says, once it's designed, the CEO, the captain, is also the one who is the steward of the vision for what that will do. And in a very real sense, there's a lot of these kinds of things that I think that are uh, quite applicable uh, to the church. Uh, I think they are effective, and I uh, have put in uh, a couple of places some comments um, in the manuscript uh, a little bit more detail. Why in the world should we be doing all of this, uh, looking at what the business people are doing, because we're out to do church work. Why should we be concerned about what the others are saying? Well, I think one of the reasons is that uh, we want to reach our communities for Christ, no matter what. One of the passages of Scripture that I appeal to often is when somebody says, you know, I don't like your methodology. I don't like your... I got one this last week, you're in America, anyway. Um, I didn't think it showed. The Apostle Paul said that he became a Jew to the Jews and a Greek to Greek, the Greeks, so that by all means he might win some. He became all things to all people, so that by all means he might win some. And the Apostle Paul used secular methodologies of the ancient world, the use of the diatribe you find throughout the book of Romans, in order to convince people of his gospel. That has always been true. The church, this is not something the church has just started. The church has always used secularism and the things that were going on in society to make an edge into or a wedge into a conversation with people so that they might hear the gospel. The Apostle Paul was certainly not different in that. All things to all people. If we can find something in the methodology that is being used today that has any value whatsoever, then I think we ought to use it. Jesus, by the way, also called to the attention of some people about a, a, a very wise steward who, when he was going to get fired, uh, began to do favors for those people that he operated with for his, uh, his uh, boss. And then when, of course, he was fired, he got a job. And Jesus talked about how wise that was. Jesus was familiar of the worldly ways of doing things. I think whatever it takes for us to win people to faith in Jesus Christ, we need to consider. As long as it has integrity and does not deny the essence of the gospel that we proclaim, we need to consider it. Um, Bailey Smith, I don't know if you know the name, but he was very actively involved in evangelism in <coughs> Southern Baptist uh, churches. 
but uh, he mentioned that though the ends do not justify the means, the means that were used never justify failure. And I like that. It's got a good ring to it. The means that were used never justify failure. If we're not doing anything for the cause of Christ, no matter what we're doing or how we're doing it in the churches, we need to consider some other means. God has called upon us to be effective churches in our community. Well, um, the effective leaders, they don't start by saying, and I put in there the not, I forgot to put it in, I wrote it in, they don't start by saying, that this is what I want, but they say, what needs to be done? An effective leader says, what uh, can and should I do to make a difference? Uh, they use the organization's <coughs> mission and goals. This is the old management by objective uh, that we learned a number of years ago uh, for performance evaluation. If the objective of our church is to reach out into our community and touch people's lives, it doesn't matter if we have the best musical program in town. If the pews are half empty and nobody's coming around and nobody cares, who cares what kind of a musical program we have? Maybe it blesses the saints, but it doesn't do anything for the rest of the folks. How effective is it? And they use that on a regular basis, and I think that's not inappropriate for Christians to ask. I think the Apostle Paul would have been very frustrated if he just went out, he was faithful, he did all the right things, but he didn't accomplish anything. And I shared something about a story on uh, tomorrow night about an army that did absolutely everything right and they still lost the battle. So where's the glory in that? Anyway, they were refused to change because what they were doing was the right stuff. They typically tolerate diversity. They have an enormous ability to tolerate diversity, but they do not tolerate poor performance or poor standards, substandards of behavior or values that are inappropriate. Uh, that's what leaders are known for correcting. They're not afraid of strength in their associates. There are a number of people who are fearful of having an associate that's stronger than them or knows more than they do. True leaders aren't concerned about that. They got them there for that reason. They aim to be the kind of person also that they respect the most and that they believe in. They try to avoid the temptation to do things just because it's popular. I will do it because everybody thinks I should do it. And even though I'm not convinced that it's right, I'm going to do it because, goodness, it would be very unpopular if I didn't. What do you think Jesus would say about that? Um, certainly, popularity is not a basis for making a decision. One needs to be careful. I will never go under for where we hang the chandeliers or what color the carpet is in the church. I have preferences, but I'm not going to follow my sword on that one. But when you take a risk and when you stand up, it needs to be for a big issue and you don't go just because something is popular and you never submit yourself to doing that which is petty, using the office or the role of leader that you have or mean or sleazy. Uh, the people are not so much talkers as they are doers and they delegate everything except what they do with excellence and what they want to be remembered for. Everything that you do with excellence, that's what you want to continue to do, but everything else you learn how to delegate. Leaders delegate. They know that they cannot do everything. And I know that there's some people that say, you know, I can do a better job in the calling in my church than anybody else, so I guess I should do it. And they don't get anything else done because they're doing all the calling. Now, somebody else may not do it as well, but what do you want to be known for? Moving your church forward or doing your calling? And the calling is an important area of ministry. One needs to be careful. I was told one time about a pastor that I suspect some people think is successful, and I've had some struggles with some of the things that he's done, but Tudor only made two calls in 10 years, and uh, one was on uh, Hubert Humphrey, and the other was John Wayne, and they both died, so he wasn't that effective with the call. <laughs> <laughs> they know also that it's important to foster a culture that is open for change because the world changes, and the church or the community that doesn't change dies. Think of all of the great products of years ago that were very famous, and we don't hear them anymore. Remember the Burma Show sign? Just know that's maybe south of the border. Uh, I hate to say this one, Carter's Little Liver Pills, and then there was Lumen's Cough Drops. These were big name items at one time, and, and um, 
halo shampoo and uh, glorifies your hair and, and all of those things that died out. They didn't know how to change. And they died. Some of the Colgate products knew how to change and they're still around. The uh, executives are capable of managing, but some of them they know are unfit to manage. And that's where the issue of character and integrity comes into play. So whenever a person is involved in something that they know that they ought not to be involved in, whatever else leaders can do, if they <coughs> lose their opportunity to lead because of their character and integrity, that's something you can't buy back. Uh, Harold Menton shared with us in chapel uh, the other day about uh, the one thing you can't buy back is your name when you've given it away. You're absolutely right on target. They typically follow up questions and they openly ask uh, um, uh, questions of those. They follow up everything that is, they've asked somebody to do. They ask questions about it. They openly express their gratitude. Uh, that's one of the areas where some people have a great deal of difficulty. Just thanking somebody and thanking somebody public for what they do. There are effective things that Christian leaders do, and I'm switching from the world <coughs> leadership crew to those that are typical of Christians that are doing uh, responsible work in healthy churches. They model change and they don't ask of others what they will not do. They know how important it is to be an example of the believer in word and in deed. And they rely heavily on other leaders. They share their vision with them. Uh, those that feel, I'm the only leader in the church. I'm the only one that's got this. I'm the only one that can do it. They miss an awful lot of what God has entrusted to every congregation. Key people, leadership that uh, can be involved in it. They read the environment and they adapt to it without compromising their beliefs. Reading the environment is a very important thing that leaders do. They look around. They know demography. Leaders are into demography. Leaders know what's taking place in their communities uh, all the time. Uh, how many... Uh, what's the percentage of singles in your community? What's the percentage of uh, divorcees in your community? What's the, the average income in your community? How many unemployed are in your community? Uh, what are the problems that the kids are facing in the community? And how do you want to reach them for Christ? You've got to know that stuff to be able to adapt the gospel to reach those people and those particular needs. You cannot do it, I think, by just burying your head in the sand and say, just going to read my Bible, just going to give the word of God. That's it. You have to know how to apply the word of God to the hearts of people. They involve themselves generally only in strategic uh, uh, big decisions. I'm going to skip through a couple of these because I'm running out of time. I have too many funny stories I want to share with you, and I don't have time to get through the outline as well. Isn't that awful? It's a terrible thing. But typically leaders are involved in the major decisions, but they delegate in other decisions. It's okay. Those that are likely to sink the battleship, they need to be involved in. But the rest of them, it's okay. Uh, I've been to boards that had to talk about what kind of a trash can we ordered for the church. It's absurd. Who cares? What difference will it make? What color it is, whether it's out of plastic or aluminum or whatever. Let somebody just give it to them. Let them decide. It's amazing how many churches waste time by having committees to decide something that one person could do and it's not likely to sink the battleship and the church can probably survive the decision. Probably. <laughs> when I was in college, I roomed with eight guy, or five guys and there was one fellow which we rotated our responsibilities out and each week it was somebody else's turn to go out and buy all the groceries. We contributed our five dollars. We each paid fifteen dollars um, a month for rent. That lets you know what kind of a place it was. And, um, <laughs> and we had a guy that we, it was his week to go out and buy the groceries and he found a bargain on peaches. And he spent every dollar we had on can peaches. We got them for eight cans, uh, rather, yeah, eight cans for a dollar. We, I hated peaches after a short period of time. <laughs> he was one we didn't delegate that responsibility to anymore. He blew it. Uh, these individuals know how to motivate, mobilize, resource, and uh, pursue a jointly shared vision with people. If the vision that you have is yours alone, you have not worked through it adequately. Uh, if you have a vision for what your church ought to be, you need to work that through with your leaders and share that with your church. And everybody in the church needs to know what that is. One of the key characteristics of 
uh, leaders today is that they communicate vision. They articulate it. They're the stewards of it. But it may start with them, but it can never stay with them. And it gets modified the further out they share that vision. What do you think that God might be wanting us to do in our community for Christ? And how can we do it more effectively? I think that vision has to be shared with a whole congregation. I remember I spoke to a group of folks, it was uh, church leaders at a conference in California at a Baptist camp. They went up to the camp and they, so we talked about uh, what their church was all about. And I said, could any of you tell me what your mission statement is? And I had a copy of it in my hand. It was two and a half pages long. Even the pastor couldn't say what was in there. How can anybody buy into it if they don't know what it is? Uh, Drucker is well known for saying that if you can't put your vision statement on a coffee cup, it's too long. Another person modified that, said if you can't put it on a t-shirt and read it from 20 feet away, it's too big. What are we all about? How do we say that to people? Uh, sharing that vision and working on it. Um, characteristics of uh, Christian leaders is that they organize, uh, well, I can run through a few of them, but they calculated risk takers, they cast a vision, they organize and strategize for spiritual growth. Uh, their leaders are doing team building. And uh, a good leader knows <coughs> that he or she, there's a lot of good she's out there. We had one in our um, woman in our uh, board of deacons in Santa Clara. She was the president of the local college, and her PhD was in administration. She knew how to get things done. Believe me, she was our most competent person. But uh, she also knew that if you want to do something well, it takes more than one person. And if it takes more than one person, you need leadership. And you must do leadership well if you're going to have a good product that comes out of it. Um, leaders are also there for the long haul. They're not here today from John Tamar. Uh, I'm sure that you know of pastors. Uh, some things are known as 90-day wonders, and they're wondering why God hasn't blessed their ministry. One of the reasons is I can't find them. I haven't got a clue where they are. They're moved again. These people are there. They said, I'm going to be there. And God knows where to find me. And I want to be a part of what, what God is doing. And there's conflict in churches. And they learn how to deal with conflict. Uh, they're not opposed to dealing with conflict. Uh, sadly, we haven't prepared... Uh, uh, ministers for dealing with conflict as adequately as we need to, and that's true everywhere. And I never had one course on it when I was in seminary. Nobody ever talked about it when I was in seminary. I had the idea that if I got out of seminary, I'd take all of this vast wealth of knowledge I knew, I would go out and share it with the people, and they would all get saved, and everybody would love me. <laughs> None of those things were true. <laughs> I... Uh, I'll be talking on love on Wednesday morning. But I remember a pastor saying to his congregation, he was preaching on love, he said, when we get to heaven, he says, I'm going to love all of you. And all of you are going to love me. But some of you are going to have to change. <laughs> I think uh, the letter I in there, leading a staff by example, and informed decisions. We should never ask anybody to do anything that we wouldn't ourselves truly do. Marilla Parsley, a great leader that I knew in the state of Arizona was an executive minister a number of years ago. I remember him coming up to a camp and we had a problem with plumbing and he got in there, rolled up, took off his shirt, he had a t-shirt on, reached his arm in a pipe like this and pulled out more crudders than you could imagine. He did the dirty stuff and then when he started, everybody else joined in we followed suit. He was a leader. He was willing to do other things. I had a young person who I was absolutely thrilled with, and he came to be my uh, the youth pastor of our church in uh, Nebraska. And uh, he was a bright student, straight-A student, got a, a several academic awards when he was in seminary. And uh, I said, whoa, wouldn't it be wonderful to have this guy on board? And, uh, and he came, and I was so thrilled, and I was Praising the Lord that he got this guy. Uh, he had a problem. He 
and, and thought everybody should look to him. And everybody should be praising him for all of his terrific uh, deeds and, and uh, accomplishments. He could preach. He was a good preacher. I mean, he was a lot better than I was at it. He was a good uh, singer. Wow, could he sing. Everybody wanted to sing at their weddings. He played the guitar. He played uh, the piano. He could play a uh, trumpet. Uh, the guy was just talent coming out everywhere. But one Sunday morning, our custodian had had a heart attack on a Friday. He was in the hospital, and it had snowed the night before. And I got to the church early, and uh, we didn't have anybody else around. And, and so I was shoveling some snow to get it off of the sidewalk so people would not fall. And I still remember this fellow coming up. He drove up uh, a few minutes later. And I asked him if he could give me a hand uh, to clear the, the snow away. And he said, I never forgot the line, I have a master of divinity, and I don't shovel snow. <laughs> I had a PhD at the time. I don't know what that says. <laughs> Leaders... somebody else of the integrity of that as a ministry for Christ, whether it's cleaning the floor, making cookies, greeting folks at the door, or anything else. Any one of us, if we're going to be leaders, ought to be willing to do any one of those things as well. Leaders seek a consensus if they get it, but they always lose. Leaders exemplify compassion and vision and excellence and intelligent choices, and they have a concern for their subordinates. I served in a church in uh, California that uh, my pastor was a godly man, and I know he loved the Lord, and, and I think uh, he loved me, and we're good friends to this day. But when I came on board, we never did anything together. I had dinner with him before I started, and he was happy that I was willing to be his youth pastor. And after 15 months, and I stayed with him for 18, after 15 months, I went into his office, and I said, uh, is there something I'm doing wrong? I said, no, why? What's the problem? Well, I've been here for over a year now. We haven't had a cup of coffee together. You haven't invited me to go to the ministerial association with you. I'd really like to go because I'm planning on the ministry. And I, I, want, I want to do that. You haven't told me what I do or anything. Well, Lee, I just want to give you freedom to do what you want to do. I think in his heart he meant all the right kinds of things. But he never did anything with me. And it was killing me inside. And I eventually left the church. Uh, went somewhere else where somebody took note of me. Uh, leaders are concerned about those that are involved, uh, they're involved with their subordinates. Um, John Maxwell uses the illustration of every subordinate staff member in the church carries with him two buckets. Have you heard that one? And um, one has a bucket of, uh, it's a bucket of water, and the other is gasoline. And they're going to put one of those buckets on a problem that they're facing. <laughs> and the one that can tell them which bucket to put is the pastor, the leader in the church, one of the leaders in the church. And these are people, leaders in the making. And they can put a bucket of gasoline on a terrible situation, and it can become incredibly explosive. And they often don't know which bucket to put on it if no one has spent time with them and supported them and encouraged them and prayed with them and talked with them and listened to their hurts and pains and so on. That is taking time with them. It's very, very important. Well, there's um, a problem with leadership today, and I probably should conclude with a problem and then ask if there's some questions that folks are interested in along the way. One of the problems of leadership is that when pastors are surveyed about their most significant gifts and the ones that they gave priority to, as a survey, George Barna took the survey a, a year and a half ago, 69% of the pastors said that their gift, their area of responsibility, their primary gift was that of preaching and teaching. 15% said pastoring, and that meant they really liked doing the typical hands-on things, the marrying, the burying, the baptizing, the making the calls, the visitations, and so on. 
uh, 15% said their gift was administration. That's not always the same and equal to a leader. An administrator is a manager primarily, and they saw themselves primarily as managers of the resources the church had put at their disposal. 6% said they had the gift of evangelism, and 5% said their primary gift was leadership. In the survey, they also noticed that those who complained most about conflicts in ministry were those who said they didn't have any issue or area of uh, uh, competence in the area of leadership skills. And I think a significant cause for their failures is a lack of leadership skills. It's that important. Uh, uh, seminaries, various schools need to do some training in this area, and those that don't invite problems later on. Pastors are put in leadership roles, and if they don't function with leadership abilities, they simply cannot handle the responsibilities that are before them, and it's a critical issue. Um, I'm just trying to think in terms of uh, a couple of things. I'm going to let me move ahead to a couple of other areas. I'm out of time. The big key. Uh, leaders certainly understand that if they're going to touch the lives of people and get them to follow them, they must first, first touch their hearts. People have to believe in them. They must know that they're acceptable. I want to uh, look at the area of recognizing leaders and pastors, especially for you. Uh, there's some biblical models. Leaders typically don't appoint themselves, so the church always is involved in the New Testament and calling out leaders, and the church selected the leaders in the Acts chapter 6, the passage that Dr. Sykes shared with you uh, a moment ago. Uh, Paul speaks about the church being slow and laying on hands, and that's the ordination process. Uh, in uh, the, uh, the Timothy passage. There are things to consider when looking for leaders. Uh, we want to elevate those spiritual gifts by means of tests of members. We ask uh, uh, people what gifts that they have that they don't know. There's all kinds of ways by which you can assess their spiritual giftedness. There are a number of uh, uh, gift, uh, I'm trying to think, surveys or tests that are floating out on the market the most popular one is the one by Richard House. You've seen that one or some of you heard of it. Uh, Richard was a colleague of ours in Sioux Falls and put it together. Uh, the, only, the only problem with that one, and by the way, that's one of the better ones that's out there, is Richard only listed the gifts that are listed in the New Testament, and no passage in the New Testament has them all. Uh, and Paul wrote to the Romans, Romans chapter 12, where you find one of the lists. He didn't list the same ones that he listed in 1 Corinthians 12. And the ones that are in Ephesians 4 are not the same that are found also in those other two passages. And then you find the first Peter uh, chapter uh, 4 uh, text with a few others. But none of them have all of them together. Paul was not trying to be inclusive. There are all kinds of gifts of the Spirit, gifts that can be used to further the cause of Christ, to build up the church, and cause the kingdom to be expanded. So if we, if we keep that kind of a thing in mind, that's still an excellent guide for surveying the giftedness of the people in your uh, in your congregation. Uh, ask congregations who they think the capable leaders are. Often they will share with you. They are the people in the church that are you at buttons. When they speak, others listen. I do remember a lovely lady who had been at church. Her name was Tammy Anderson. She did not have uh, anything more than a high school degree. She taught Sunday school for over 50 years. Actually, 75 total. She took four years out to have children. She was 95. When she died, she died watching the World Series when it was the Kansas City Royals and the St. Louis uh, crew that were coming in, the cards, um, and she was cheering for the Royals, and she had a heart attack and died at 95. I want to go that way. Uh, she was a wonderful lady. Just a month before she died, we were trying to make some decisions about some exciting things to go on in the church. And the hardest budget ever to pass is a maintenance ministry budget. It's so boring to start with. But when you talk about wanting to do something exciting, and I was doing the best I could to convince the church that this is what they ought to do, and, and the deacons were standing up and saying, yeah, we ought to do it, and it was sort of nickety-tuck until Tammy Anderson stood up, and she said, I've been in the church here for over 80 years, and God has never failed us once, and every time I remember, every time that we ever stepped out on faith, God never let us down. And we should do these things, she listed the reasons why, and when she sat down, everybody applauded, we took a vote, and we did it. Who was the leader that night? Tammy Anderson. 
there are some skills that people can develop, but there are certain people with a certain giftedness in, um, in uh, the area of leadership. There's a big question that people have about whether leader, leaders are born or whether they're trained. Uh, my answer to that is yes. Uh, I think some of them have natural inclinations for it, but everybody can learn something about leadership, and they can certainly avoid some major mistakes by trying to, to work on some of their skills. Uh, this is, I think, the, the pastor. I think, as a leader of a church, certainly no pastor can avoid that. There are people nowadays that talk about what to call the pastor. I'm sure you've heard folks talk about the rancher model. They say, well, let's, let's call the pastor a rancher because ranchers are tough, you know, and they can make tough decisions. I've been out with uh, shepherds uh, and uh, sheep, and those shepherds can be a little tough, too. I like the, the model of the shepherd because as a pastor, which, of course, that's the same term, Jesus uh, was the great shepherd, and the New Testament speaks of that, and I prefer those biblical titles, but... CEO, uh, if people rightly understand it, I think that's, there's something to uh, commend itself, but uh, in terms of authority within the church, a pastor should never be an authoritarian, should never be a dictator, but work together with people. But there are certain things that the church has called the pastor to do and to be involved in doing, and the church needs to give the pastor enough authority to carry out the responsibility that they placed on the pastor. I've sat with a number of uh, uh, boards that were discussing their previous pastor after they left and were tearing the person apart, never did anything for the church. And so I asked the question, did your pastor ever come together or come to you with a proposal of what to do in the ministry that would help it? And did you follow that? Don't tell me the pastor failed if you didn't follow the pastor's lead. One of the things that you see in the Hebrews 13 uh, verse 17 text is that the people uh, that the author of Hebrews was writing to was uh, they were supposed to listen to those who had a leadership role over their lives in the Lord. Uh, we need to be careful about judging a pastor when we don't follow the pastor's lead. And uh, I, I'm one of those that uh, I cannot imagine going against a pastor in the church as a member of the church. I think God has put that person there. Uh, priorities, and then I'll stop. Let me just give this to my wife and she will stick that up there. The last, I don't even know if that's the right one. I can't see it. If it isn't, we can turn it off. No, we'll get it. Every minister, every leader who is a minister, and most ministers are leaders by position, at least, and they need to acquire the skills for leadership, and there's a number of them, and I have all that stuff in this box. Isn't that neat? It's all out there for you in the, with a bibliography. We need to establish priorities. You cannot do it all. And the first priority is God, your relationship with God. I shared with the students in chapel some time back that if, if that area of their life is not intact, everything else they do is a waste of time. If you are not in tune with God, you do not have the integrity of a man or woman of God, you cannot lead the people of God. It just won't work. And it's essential that we maintain that as a high priority. It's one of the highest priorities. All too often it's been minimized, and there's some ministries that minimize it. Typically, congregations are interested in people who are men and women of God. Pastors are interested in knowing how to do something. Often seminaries are interested in knowing that their pastors that they graduated won't embarrass them by saying something that's wrong theologically out there. We want them to have more knowledge, but you can't bypass your contact with God. Your family is absolutely essential. Uh, when I went to my last church, I was asked what my highest priorities would be, and I said, aside from my relationship with God, is to be a better father than I've ever been before, because I've not been a good one. I gave the church priority over my life. I gave the church highest priority over my family and my children to remember that. And I'm going to do the best that I can to be a good father and a good husband I hope I can be a, have enough time left over to be a good pastor. That's where I'm coming from. Pastors cannot do it all, and they have to prioritize the time. The pastors that have the greatest difficulty are those who don't prioritize who they'll see. You cannot see them all. Um, I like the model, and I use it as the 10 to 1 model, uh, where 
uh, John Maxwell has categorized people on a one to ten. A one is a person who needs a full-time pastor all for him or her. I mean, they've got more problems. They're never done with problems. And a ten is a person who's got their act together. They're walking with the Lord. They're growing in their faith. And they have leadership capabilities. And he says, unfortunately, 80% of the pastors spend 75% of their time with ones, twos, and threes. And they ignore, most of the time, the eights, nines, and tens. Well, what about the ones, twos, and threes? The fact of the matter is, if we train the eights, nines, and tens to the ministry, they'll take care of the ones, twos, and threes, and we can turn them over, and they need to be cared for. Most of those in the fours, five, six uh, category, in the sevens category, wonderful people, salt of the earth, they'll do anything you ask them to do. They're not leaders, and they shouldn't be put on boards and made leaders. They're wonderful people. The pastors need to prioritize. I used as a standard for me, if I could not solve their problem within three visits, I referred. Only once or twice did I ever violate that because I simply didn't have the time. There's not enough time in the day. And there are certain people that need counseling that I'm incompetent to counsel. And I learned, even at the end of one counseling session, this is, I'm over my head. I need to refer. It's okay. I'm a spiritual counselor. I understand the scriptures and their import for our lives, but a person could be out of zinc in terms of their world of reality, and I'm not trained to deal with that. So I refer that. Learning how to prioritize who you give time to. Thanks for listening to me. I'm going to stop. I was told we have a few minutes for time for some interaction. If anybody wants to make some comments or raise a question or whatever, and uh, we'll go upstairs in a few minutes and have uh, a some refreshment. Uh, where is Mark? If I didn't offend you too much, could I possibly ask somebody to uh, get these out at the door so that people don't go but want them? Maybe they might want them. If not. The those that have that chair that they want to endow, here's another. Uh, 